broken every barrier down thou to be thine yea thine alone O Lamb of God I come I come Well good morning everyone welcome to Geneseo United Methodist Church I'm Bob Hill, standing in for a few minutes for Pastor Harry here. Um, You've all heard of people having a reaction to their second shot. Well, Pastor Harry had a reaction to his second shot and wasn't feeling well this morning. So I got the message this morning Would I just open up the service and close the service. And we'll be having a recorded sermon of Pastor Harry's from about a year ago. And we all know that Pastor Harry's messages are so good that we don't mind listening to one of them twice. Um, Any announcements from the congregation this morning? We do continue to have Wednesday live uh, Bible study. And we started last week having fellowship at the back of the church. We've got a big circle of chairs, six feet apart. We're all wearing our masks. And... uh, You know, just kind of break the ice again. You know, we all miss one another. It's been a long time, and we're lonesome for one another. We love one another. We want to hear what's been going on in our lives. And so we do have that opportunity. If you want to just stop for five minutes, ten minutes, uh, half hour, whatever, is is, uh, is fine. Um, We do extend our sympathies uh, to the Weaven family this week as Helen Weaven passed away. Um from this community many years ago. We all loved Helen very much. She was quite a lady. Um, If there's no other joys or concerns, we'll go to prayer at this time. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your midst, Lord, and just experience what your Holy Spirit has for us today, Lord. We thank you for different things like the technology that a year ago we didn't have to do a a situation like this, Lord. We pray for Pastor Harry and all those suffering either effects from the vaccines or from the COVID or whatever, Lord. We pray for those who are lonely and, and separated, Lord. We pray that before long we'll all be joined back together and that we can gather together and worship you. We just thank you for each and every blessing that you do send us, Lord. We thank you for the talent that you've given so many in this church to to keep things going during this time, Lord, and we will come out stronger than we went in, Lord. Just, we thank you for the opportunity. Now we pray the prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Our second reading comes to us from the third chapter of John. It is a scripture you probably know quite well, uh, almost too well. Sometimes we hear the words and slip over it. It is the meeting between the Pharisee Nicodemus and Jesus. Jesus has just begun his ministry and has been out into the synagogues and he has made statements that uh, have upset some people. But Nicodemus' heart is touched beyond judgment of the other religious leaders, and he wants to get closer to Jesus to find out what's going on. But a meeting during the day would be uh, something awkward for him uh, because of his status. So it says here in the scripture that he came to him at night. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sounds, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has came from heaven the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. May God bless the reading of his word. And before we begin the message, we have... You know, there's been so many times in my life where I felt unworthy or unqualified, but God would just do something so cool in the midst of it. And one of those times was when I was a junior at the University of Florida, and we're getting ready to play Tennessee. And I see some of my teammates putting different eye blacks under their eyes. And, uh, they're putting like their mom's name or their area code under their eyes. And so I start to think, you know, I wonder if I could put something under my eyes that maybe could encourage someone or inspire someone. So I was like, well, God bless. I don't know. And I was like, well, Philippians 4.13, I could do that. You know, I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. I was like, that'll be, that'll be good for a football player. So I put it under my eyes. We were blessed to win because it was Tennessee. And, um, it really wasn't that big of a deal. After the game, a couple of local newspapers wrote about it, but it wasn't that big of a deal. But I kept wearing it under my eyes every single game. And as probably a lot of you know, Gator fans are very passionate. So four, five, six weeks later, they're selling it at the Gator bookstore, at the Florida library. <laughs> you have thousands of fans showing up to games wearing Philippians 4.13 under their eyes. And I honestly believe half of them don't even know what it means. I had one guy, his name was Phil, come up to me and say, hey, did you wear that under your eyes for me? <laughs> it's like, no, it's a Bible verse. <laughs> What are you talking about? And um, so we get to the SEC championship game at the end of the year, and we're getting ready to run out of the tunnel. And football is kind of one of those things where it's you have such tunnel vision. It's just one thing at a time, one thing at a time. And 
as I was getting ready to run out of the tunnel, I really felt like God was putting in my heart to change the verse. I was like, really, right now? And But I realized that if we won, we'd be playing a national championship on one of the biggest stages that I might ever get. And so that would be the right opportunity to change the verse. And so we were blessed to win that game. And six weeks, the next six weeks leading up to the national championship, I was agonizing and really contemplating what verse I was going to go with. And God kept bringing it to my heart and my head, John 3, 16, because it's the essence of our Christianity. It's the essence of our hope. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's what gives us hope as Christians. So I decided to go with that. And so two days before the, the game, I went up to my parents' hotel room in Miami, Florida. And I was like, Mom, Dad, I've decided to change the verse, and I'm going to go with John 3.16. My mom's super sweet and supportive. Oh, that's great, honey. My dad's like, well, have you told Coach Meyer? Because <laughs> he says he just likes his routines, but that dude is so superstitious, it's ridiculous. So he's like, you really need to tell him. So we were right down the street at FAU practicing. We finished our last practice for a national championship. I said, hey, Coach Meyer, can I talk to you for a second? He's like, yeah, how you feeling? Your arm good, leg good? You ready for the game? I was like, yeah, I'm good. Uh, you know the verse I'm wearing? He's like, yeah, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. I love it. I was like, well, I'm going to change that verse tomorrow night. What? What are you talking about? You can't change that verse. That verse got us here. <laughs> it didn't get us here. So after a couple minutes of explaining it to him, he totally was supportive and understood him. Honestly, after that, I didn't even really think about it. I just went out there and tried to win the championship game. We were blessed to win. And two days later, I was at Ballyhoo Restaurant in Gainesville, Florida with me, my mom, my dad, my aunt, and um, Coach Meyer. And probably some of you have been to Ballyhoo. And I was just sitting there eating a grouper. And um, Coach Meyer gets a call. And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. All right, bye. And I was like, who is that? He said, that was Steve McLean. Here's our PR guy at Florida. So what do you have to say? He said, did you know that during that game, 94 million people Googled John 3.16? And honestly, my first thought was, how the heck do 94 million people not know John 3.16? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Sunday school. It's like the first thing you hear, you know? But I was just sitting in Ballyhoo restaurant, just so humbled at how big that God is that we serve and how he wants to do amazing things in us and through us. And when we just step out and show a little faith or a little courage, or we just decide, hey, it's okay to be a little bit different than everybody else, what God can do in our lives. And that game just happened to be in 2009, January 8th. Well, exactly three years later, January 8th, 2012, we just happened to be playing the Pittsburgh Steelers and I never even thought about John 3.16 one time, so I can't take any credit for it. I just tried to go out there and win a playoff game, and we were blessed to win this crazy playoff game in overtime, and I run in and try to, you know, shower really quick and change, because I wanted to go celebrate my family, so I'm going, running to go and do my press conference really quick, because I love talking to the media. <laughs> And uh, right before I walk into the press conference room, Patrick, our PR guy, jumps in front of me. He says, Timmy, do you realize what happened? I was like, yeah, we just beat the Steelers. We're going to play the Patriots. Like, let me do this. He's like, no, do you realize what happened? I was like, I guess not. He said, Timmy, it's exactly three, three, not, three years from the night you wore John 316 under your eyes. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And he was like, no, you don't realize during the game, you threw for 316 yards. Your yards per completion were 31.6. Your yards per rush were 3.16. The ratings for the night were 31.6, and the time of possession was 31.06. And during the game, 90 million people Googled John 316, and it's the number one trending thing on every platform. And I was just standing there in that hallway getting ready to do this press conference thinking, that that night was about a football game. And it really wasn't, because the God that we serve is such a big God. And standing in that hallway, I knew that it was something so much more. Because the God that we serve is a God of miracles, as we're gonna hear today. And it's a God that does pretty amazing things in us and through us. And I think we just have to be willing to step out and say, here you go, God, I'm gonna give you my fish and, and my loaves of bread and watch what he does with them. But the God we serve can do pretty awesome, amazing things. One of the things that we have is a care and a love each other in this body of Christ. And what we hope for each other 
is that everyone here knows the Jesus who saved us, knows the Jesus who came to earth, gave his life, walked among us, and showed us how to live, and gave us life eternal. There isn't anything else more important for you to know. There will never be any more important decision that you will ever make. There isn't more, any more important message that you will ever hear. And there isn't any more important wish that I have for each one of you is that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This scripture that we have this morning is so familiar that we can roll it over our tongue and barely grasp its meaning. But yet in that one night, a man approached the Son of God, Jesus, and Jesus shared with him the heart of our Christianity, the heart of our hope for eternal life. For if this was not true, if this did not happen, if this was not recorded, if this was not shared with you and I, we would really truly have no hope. We could have the structure of a religion. We could have all kinds of traditions. You and I might be trying to do great things. But without this at the heart of what we believe, we would have nothing. So I want to take just a few minutes and go through what happened that evening. And one of the things that what I did as I was studying this many times and for this morning, I tried to see this through the eyes of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and we can say, well, because he was a Pharisee, because he was a religious leader, he was probably somebody I can't relate to. But I tell you, I think he is. I think he is a person who is at the top of his game. I think he is a well-educated person, a smart person, a person who knows what he is about. He is part of the Jewish ruling council, which means he is accomplished, as accomplished as many of you. And so he knows what he is about. And he has been living a life according to the rules and the laws of the Jewish laws that they live by. It was a law of right and wrong. It was a law of judgment and atonement. It was a law of, of trying to walk around with over 600 rules you're trying to keep. And you're trying to put on a good face for everybody else. And, and, uh, it, and yes, it was also a place of honor. And, but he saw in Jesus, in this radical person, this radical message about God loving us so much that he is there with us, that he came to investigate. He didn't send a committee. He didn't send a, 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 a person, a servant. He came himself, but he did come in the dark of night. So he wouldn't have to explain it to all of his uh, uh, co-workers and everybody else in the community. So he came to Jesus and Jesus gave him this radical message that he would have never heard before about being born again. Now, that isn't some Christian thing that we made up or a church made up or somebody thought that this is a cutesy thing that we ought to be using in, in, uh, in our tradition. This came from the mouth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to earth and he said to Nicodemus, this, this Pharisee, and he says to you and me, you must be born. Now, Nicodemus is like me. I get this about Nicodemus because the first thing he says, hey, what? I don't understand what you're talking about. How can this be? I can't be born again. I, I, I don't remember my first birth, but I don't think it was a good thing. And I don't think it's something I can do again. And he says something so crazy. He says, how can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? That can't happen again. I'm old. I'm big. And Jesus says, no, 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 he said. For every person will be born naturally, born of the water, born of the flesh. But to be in the kingdom of God, you must also be born again in your heart. You must be born in the spirit. That you must give your life to Jesus Christ, basically. For God so loved the world, right? So Nicodemus is hearing this, and, he, and, and you wonder what goes through his head. Like, this is this crazy idea he's never heard before. Uh, it's like I told Wade Mitchell yesterday, we were having our breakfast. I said, what if I were to come to you with this crazy idea about farming that you shouldn't plant for the next seven years? And he would say, say what? 
It's just that radical. It's that radical. It goes against everything else that Nicodemus has understood or learned or lived in his life. But yet it stuck somehow. And Nicodemus did not change his life and become a follower of Jesus. He did not become a disciple. But we see him two other places in Scripture. The second time we see him, the ruling council is meeting. All the Pharisees are up in arms. And they are planning the elimination of Jesus. And Nicodemus stands up. And he says, I don't believe this is just. But they overrule him. And they move on, and they go on with their plans to kill Jesus. The next time we see Nicodemus is after Jesus has been crucified and died on the cross. And his body lay there, and there's no place to take the body. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come forward to take the body of Jesus and place it in a tomb. This man who came that night and heard for the first time, who had this encounter with the Son of God, his life changed. Now, one of the things that, that, has, that, I, that, that gave me hope, God does not expect from me instant perfection. What God looks for me is progress. I am moving closer and closer to God. It's kind of like a conversation we had uh, it's, it's probably been six months or no, I talk about everything we do in life, whether it's a step, a word, a study, or anything we do, everything we do is either a step closer to God or a step farther away. It's kind of like that game we used to play when we were younger, and my kids still play with, with me if I lose my remote. They say, they say, you're trying to find something, and they'll sit there, and they know where it is. They'll say, oh, you're getting warmer. Oh, you're getting colder because you're moving farther away from it. And it's the truth in our life. We are either getting warmer, closer to God with every move, every word, every belief, or we are stepping away. Doesn't mean that we are getting lost, but it does mean we are stepping away from the influence of God. So what does that have to do with us 2,000 years later? You know the scripture. It is so familiar. It's like many other things in life that we have that are familiar, right? We just know them, right? Can you think of things and on your mind? Right? You want to share with me. Think of things you just know, okay? Just part of being life. You know, that, that who? Oh, long, there, there's that certain age. <laughs> and you don't mess around with Jim. Okay, all right. That, those are things we know. And here is something God wants us to know. God expects us to know. God expects us to know where this comes from. This blessing of eternal life, it comes from his son, Jesus. Now, I was pretty impressed with the video this morning. That could have been the message, and I think everybody would have walked out of here fine. Uh, I have to tell you, I was tearing up during that because I know the, the, my heart hurts sometimes when I know that the gospel message is not penetrating. It's not getting through this breastplate that we all wear that we keep it and it bounce off. And I know how many years I let it bounce off and it never penetrated from me. So I know that's an experience that people have. And I pray that, that we, that every one of us, have let this spirit in, have let this belief become real in us. The unfortunate news is that most people do not. Uh, just lately, and don't you love surveys, but I'm going to give you a survey this morning. This is a survey conducted not too long ago here in the U.S. 46% of the people that they surveyed believed in being born again. They believed it. Half of the ones who said they believed it did not believe that the Bible was the word of God and not every word in there was true. So there is a disconnect between a saying and understanding what it means. Sometimes somebody might say it's being born again. It's like a, a, a complete makeover. I might get a new tie or I might walk around my hands folded. So that means that I've been born again. But a born again is an actual change that happens within us. And it is not easy. And the old Harry grabs on to the old Harry pretty hard. And when the new Harry tries to take a step forward, it wants to pull him back. He doesn't want him to be patient. 
doesn't want him to be kind, doesn't want him to pray, doesn't want him to read the scriptures, the truth, the very living word of God. Half of the 46% of the people who say, yes, we believe we're born again, but half of them don't believe in the word that told them they were born again. Half of the 46% who said they believed in being born again said, I can get to heaven by doing more good than bad. That through my good works, God will let me into heaven. A common belief by many Christians today. And isn't that amazing that the very truth, the very thing that gives us life, the most important thing that we should know from God's word is so misunderstood by so many people. It's kind of like that game, and I almost played it this morning, but I knew the kids would make me look even more foolish than they already did. And that was the game of, remember the telephone game? You know, where you tell somebody, I tell Seth, Seth goes back and tell you, and you come back around here and we want to see what it is, and it's never the same. It's always garbled. And unfortunately, what is happening is that this gospel message is just like it's being telegraphed through this telephone game. And by the time it gets to the last person, it's getting changed because we are sharing what we think we heard instead of what we heard because we didn't hear it from the word. When we participate in that game, sharing God's word, we take God's word with us. We don't try to make up or think what God might. This most common thing that we hear. And by the way, did it tug on your heart just a little bit to hear the little ones say that verse? To hear their voices speak the truth among us. What I pray for you is that it is true in your heart. That you are saved beyond any doubt or anybody else's saying. This week I was... Um, I did share this yesterday and said I probably wouldn't share it today, but I'm going to anyway. I was uh, struggling with something. I was up early in the morning and something was really bothering me and it was last week and it was just a burden. And you all have them. I mean, we are all human. Don't think that just because I stand up here, I got nothing happening, okay? I'm, I'm not that boring. I can get in trouble just like you can. And, uh, and, and this was heavy on my heart. I, I just, it was just, I didn't know what to do. And um, I, I left the house, I got in the car, it was dark, and I was driving up 63 on my way somewhere. And, and while I was driving along, it came. Uh, it wasn't a billboard, it wasn't anything on the radio, it wasn't anything like that. But it was a word to my heart, a word to your spirit, like you receive. And it said, what difference does it make that you are born again in the handling of this problem or this situation? What difference does it make in the way that you are going to handle this? That you are a child of God. That you have given your life to Jesus Christ. And the answer rolled off as easily as good morning after that. Because sometimes we need to get the world out of the way. We need to get our own ego out of the way. We need to get our own mad out of the way. We need to get our own stuff out of the way. And be purified by the actual word of God. And what changes in me and what changes in you is that we have something to share with each other that anyone who does not have Jesus as a personal savior does not. You have the very living spirit of God inside of you. And you can walk and speak and live in that spirit and be a blessing to someone else rather than a burden. The answers to the most complex problems can be actually filtered through your relationship with God. Because I am a saved man, how might I do this business? Because I am a saved man, how might I serve on this committee? Because I am a saved man, how might I act out my role as a husband and a father in my own home? Because I am a child of God, how shall I live? How shall I do my work? How shall I honor everyone I come in contact? And how shall I remember that everyone we meet is doing the best they know how to do, including me? Nicodemus, when he came that night, was doing the best he knew how to do. Because that's what has worked for him all his life. He couldn't just stand up and say, I'm for Jesus. 
it would have gone completely against who he was and what he knew. So he came in the only way he knew. And God is so, so patient with each of us in that way. We each come in our own way. We each come in our own time. We each come in our own understanding of, of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it comes in waves, in steps, in titles, and we move closer and closer to our loving God. I pray for you, and I hope you pray for me, that this will be at the heart of who we are in Christ. Let us pray this morning. Lord God, we honor you with everything we are doing this morning as we come together to worship you. We come here for the fellowship of believers who give us strength. We come here for your word that enlightens and strengthens us. And Lord, we come here to be touched and comforted by your spirit. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, was that a powerful message or what? Is anybody listening to this? Just feel like uh, maybe that was God was talking to you, that uh, that was your old life before Christ. I know I do. I know I ran from Jesus Christ for 49 years. And then I turned around one day, and there he was, standing there saying, Bob, I love you. Let me into your heart, Bob. Even though I was baptized right here at this altar, even though I was confirmed right here at this altar, the light had not gone on. For 49 years, I lived my life as I wanted to. And then on October 21st, 1998, in Pensacola, Florida, I heard a message that God had a better plan for my life. That I could have forgiveness of my sins. That I could have a new life in Christ. That God could give me a heart transplant. And that's the night that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I'm sure there's some of you here today that have known me all my life since I was a toddler that are thankful that God got a hold of me and changed my life. And he can do that for each and every one of us. God loves us so much and he has a plan for our lives. A better plan, not the plan of the world but God's plan, a plan for an abundant life, an obedient life, a life in trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And with that, I'd like to close. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your presence being here with us today. We know your word says you will never leave us or forsake us. We pray that everyone who hears this message will be affected by it. We pray that every person will turn their hearts and will know that you will carry them through the storms of life. Lord, we thank you for being with us through this pandemic. We know that it's you who've been carrying, carrying us. Now may we go forth and be a blessing to each and every person that you put in our path in this coming week. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Just as I